on Happy Monday. Hey, Carrie. Um, first of all, excuse my voice. I've got a little cold today, so I might be clearing my throat once in a while. And this this froggy thing is because of that, not not because I took up smoking in the last <laughs> week or anything. But, uh, uh, but all right. Well, we'll we'll <laughs> let you go this time, and Melissa will be on the lookout for coughs and uh, and such, and we'll just cut it out for you. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So so the Fed is, uh, I guess, the big story in the markets now because stocks are way up, and uh, the 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 dominant story relating to that is that um, Jerome Powell, the new chairman of the Federal Reserve, um, just said that he would tolerate higher inflation for a while in order to maintain the recovery or the, you know keep the expansion going. Um, which is kind of sort of what people have been looking for ever since the stock market started getting really volatile. You know, there was a number on the decline of the Dow and the S&P that would cause the Fed to do something to try to manipulate the markets. And it turns out that maybe a 10% drop was uh, was about enough because the Fed has now come out and said, ah, you know, don't worry about us tightening excessive, excessively in the short run. We will um, tolerate inflation that's above of target for a while. And, you know, that was always to be expected. Sooner or later, they were going to have to reverse course and come back in with massive QE if the financial markets started to drift down into, uh, you know, much overdue bear market. Because th this has been really the longest stretch of steady increases in stock prices that we've ever seen. And the reason for that is government manipulation. You know, we've been pushing interest rates down to uh, artificially low levels, which makes stocks seem artificially attractive relative to, for instance, bond yields. Uh, but over the past six or so months, bond yields have been starting to go up, which has <clears throat> made stocks less relatively attractive and caused huge volatility in the markets. Uh, the Fed feels obligated to respond to that because the system is so highly leveraged now with all the debt that we've taken on that um, instability in the markets, which used to be something that was just, you know, commonplace and, and you, the real economy was barely even affected by um, equity bear markets. Now it's something that's systemically risky. You know, it, we, the actual system is ex existentially threatened by a bear market inequities. So the government, led by the Fed, feels obligated to intervene on very short notice, you know, with just a, you know, a 10% drop in stock prices, here they are saying, well, we'll take higher inflation, don't worry, you know, we're going to keep the ex expansion going, um, which of course, leads to imbalances in other areas. You know, if we take two, two and a half or 3% inflation for the next few years, then all of a sudden a bond yielding one or 2% uh, or even 3% has a negative real yield. And what does that do to the fixed income market? It causes the, the instability that uh, existed in stocks over the past few months to migrate over to fixed income and, you know, it's, or to the currency markets where who wants to hold the currency of a country that's accepting 3% inflation, you know, as far as the eye can see. Uh, so we, we trade a currency crisis for a stock market crisis. Um, and all of which means that you, you, there is no free lunch. You know, if you do something that creates instability, then there will be an instability somewhere. And you can try to tamp it down in one area of the system, but it's going to bubble back up somewhere else. So this just leads to, um, at some point, a dollar crisis. You know, in, in other words, accepting higher inflation is part of the currency war scenario in which we actively devalue our currency in order to gain a trade advantage in order to keep the economy growing that disadvantages our neighbors our trading partners and they suffer for our financial mismanagement which leads them to respond in kind and then you get this kind of race to the bottom in currency values uh, that's the currency war scenario and accepting higher inflation is is one of the weapons in a currency war so we're seeing it play out kind of according to script right now Mm hmm. So this isn't surprising, though, really, is it? Well, some kind of Fed response to the instability in the stock market is absolutely not surprising because, they, you know, over the past, what is it now, 30 years since the 1990s? Um, 
that's been Fed policy. Anytime there's any kind of an incipient crisis anywhere in the world, really, the Fed intervenes by cutting interest rates, by increasing the money supply, by um, giving loan guarantees to threatened sectors, and, and now by um, tacitly or explicitly in accepting higher rates of inflation. So this is all part of the, the process that began with Alan Greenspan back in the, the mid 1990s. You know, when he started bailing out everybody in sight every year, you know, there was a new crisis and then he would step in and save the big banks. And then next year, uh, another crisis and he would save the big banks again. Um, that told Wall Street basically that they can do anything they want to and pretty much get away with it. Uh, so this should be seen as part of that process, just continued with some new terminology and new faces among the talking heads. But it's, a, you know, it's basically exactly the same thing as we started doing in the 1990s. So effectively, you're saying is Yellen's gone, but Yellen lives on. Long, yeah, the chairman is dead, long live the chairman. You know. um, <laughs> Basically, yeah. You know, it doesn't matter. These are interchangeable parts at the Fed. They're all the same people. You know, they go went to the same schools. They hang out at the same clubs. They have dinner together. They they uh, teach at the same universities. They work in the same bureaucracies. And they all believe the same thing, which is that uh, government should actively intervene in the markets in order to smooth out the fluctuations and to keep growth going, um, which is the opposite you know, of what you and I believe, obviously. Yeah, right? yeah it's profoundly wrong. I'm so many different levels because uh, markets have a function, you know, to, to these guys who are running monetary policy. Now, markets exist as public policy tools in order to get people to borrow and spend. You know, the, the more you can push the stock market up, the more excited people get, the more likely they are to put a nice vacation on their credit card and the more likely the economy is to grow in the moment. You know, when that vacation gets taken, um, uh -huh. they ignore the amount of debt that accumulates during this process and that debt eventually becomes a fatal flaw in the system. And we have taken on so much debt over the past 30 years uh, that it's, it's, you know, it's completely unprecedented um, in scale, both nominally and relative to the economies that are taking on the debt. So in that sense, it's unprecedented. But in a, a more relevant sense, we've seen it all before. You know, countries have borrowed tons of money before. And in each and every case, they've had some kind of a crisis that either related to their currency or to the collapse of their the, the leveraged financial system that they'd created. Um, and, and so it's reasonable to think that the whole world is headed for something like that as we take on absolutely insane amounts of debt. Uh, the guys in charge of monetary and fiscal policy around the world don't get this, though. You know, the U.S. is now, um, what is it, eight years into a, an economic expansion, is ramping up fiscal stimulus as well as the, you know, the Fed now talking about monetary stimulus. We're, we're setting up policies where we've cut taxes and we're increasing infrastructure and defense spending in a way that'll give us trillion dollar deficits basically forever. And that's a lot of debt for just the government to be taking on. So in order to manage that debt, they've got to keep interest rates low, which is another way of saying they've got to encourage the private sector to borrow huge amounts of money and then spend it in the moment, which generates taxable um, income, which raises the tax take of the government, which lowers their need to borrow going forward. Um, you know, it keeps it around a trillion, in other words, uh, if we can maintain growth. But, you, you know, massive increases in private sector debt are also destabilizing. So that's mm -hmm. not a long term fix. That's basically just get us through the next election cycle and then we'll let our successors worry about it. So that, that's the way it's been with the, the people running the Fed. You know, that that's just a job interview, an extended job interview in which they show the banking system that they can be good team players so that they get hired afterwards. You know, as we talked about before we went live, um, Bernanke now works for a, a high frequency trading hedge fund. <laughs> yeah. Well, if so, you can't uh, if you can't beat them, join them, right? Yeah, I mean that's basically a criminal enterprise that front runs and gets away with it because they own the regulatory apparatus. Um, and and so now you've got the uh, the ex head of the Fed who made you know, minuscule money, a couple hundred grand a year while working mm -hmm. at the Fed now probably makes millions of dollars a year as the um, 
the, the benign face of this high frequency trader. And that's how it works at the Fed. You don't go there for the money. Uh, you go there for the immediate prestige, you know, for being on CNBC and, and face the nation and stuff like that. And for the serious money that comes afterwards, when all the friends you've made on Wall Street start offering you big time jobs. Um, and, I, you know, I think it's fairly clear that this isn't even implicit. This is probably explicit. You know, when somebody takes over the Fed, uh, he's still hanging out with his friends on Wall Street and they're yeah. still telling him, yeah, you know what? Um, help us out this year, you know, give us lower interest rates yeah. and, you know, help us generate a lot of profits from our prop trading desk. And we will totally make it worth your while when the time comes, you know, and, and I'm, I'm sure they literally say those words, um, but they don't have to. It's kind of understood within yeah. the regulatory agencies now that if you're regulating an industry, you are basically interviewing for a job with that industry at some later point. And, you know, the Fed is just the biggest example of that everywhere else it's the same thing, um, which is why we should expect policies from the Fed that benefit Wall Street and sometimes only Wall Street or Wall Street and the political class. You know, it helps incumbents get reelected, too. Oh, sure. Um, so, you know, you, you leave the Fed and you go be a, a, a hedge fund guy or a, a consultant or a lobbyist or something like that, and you make huge amounts of money. That's just the way the system works. So you know they're not going to bite the hands that feed them. And Powell's recent statements are, are just a, another example of that. You know, they'll do whatever it takes to maintain stability. But, and this is the important part, beyond a certain point, you can't maintain stability. You know, there's a certain level of debt that blows up the system. Well, and yeah. all we're doing now is establishing what that level is. You know, we don't know ahead of time what it's going to be. We'll only find out after the system blows up and we'll look back and go, oh, yeah, it was 400 percent of GDP. That was the level of debt we can't get beyond. Um, we'll find out. But I, I suspect we're pretty damn close to it because we've taken on so much debt that, uh, that that going much beyond this just guarantees increasing volatility in the markets until it all blows up. We'll see. And blow up. It will, no doubt. Well, it's just not going to happen the way that we expect it, though. You know, that's the thing. It's going to happen in a whole different, for some reason, nobody's going to see it coming except you and I, right? Well, the, you know, the day it happens, of course, nobody really, you know, because you can't know until after the fact whether something like we had earlier this month, you know, thousand point drops in the stock market, uh, whether that's the beginning of the end or just a squiggle which generates a response from the Fed, which sends stocks back up, you know, that that could also be the case here. So we can't know, except with hindsight, um, what exactly is the end, you know, what what brings it about. But I'll tell you what, those those thousand point drops in the stock market, that's how it will look when the end comes. And, uh, and it'll be more than that. You know, we'll, we'll see uh, the stock market drop to the point where they have to close the market. Um, to, to staunch the bleeding for a while. And we'll see gold and silver go up, you know, 100 bucks in a day in gold and 10 bucks a day in silver. And, and uh, we'll see the bond market um, reel from interest rates spiking. You know, all of this is coming. Where, where bonds actually drop by, say, 5% in a day, which is an extremely big move for the bond market because interest rates are spiking. And since the bond market is much bigger than the equities market, that kind of a move costs trillions of dollars around the world. Mm -hmm. So you know, remember the um, the talks that we had a while ago when uh, stocks were tanking and the world's richest people were losing, you know, tens of billions of dollars on a daily basis, although it was just a, you know, a small dent in the trillions that they own. But it was a really big number for the world's billionaires to be losing. That That's also going to be front page news when the time comes. For sure. Hey, so, so what about China? We've got like a tin horn dictator there now, it seems, a president for life. The only thing that's missing is the military uniform with all the metals hanging from it. <laughs> well, um, China is the latest in a long tradition of um, authoritarian countries that look like they're the future. You know, to put this in context, yeah, you have to go back to the early 20th century when the Soviet Union was was you know moving people off farms and into factories and generating huge amounts of quote unquote growth. And you know, a lot of people were going there to visit and coming back and saying, "I've seen the future and it works." You know, we were terrified that that system was going to outcompete us, and of course, it didn't. It failed miserably because. Um, 
Um, dictatorships aren't flexible. So they, they look good while they're going linear, you know, but as soon as the world goes nonlinear, which it does every once in a while, dictatorships fail. Then in the 70s and 80s, it was Japan who had this kind of top down bureaucracy that allocated resources between its different industries. And they were doing great. Um, and we were terrified that they would just, you know, build this robot workforce that would uh, take over the world. And that failed, too. You know, they borrowed a bunch of money and they uh, they borderline collapsed. And now they're sort of a zombie country. It's just kind of borrowing more and more money each year just to maintain the social services that their aging population needs. Uh, so China is the latest in that um, series of countries that we're terrified of because it looks like their di dictatorship is super efficient, you know, and, and we can't compete with that because democracies are so messy. So what they did lately was they, they just did away with term limits on their, their president, the head of the, the Communist Party. So he now is effectively dictator for life. Um, and at the same time, they're instituting something called a social credit score, which is, uh, uh, you know, a fascinating high tech version of, of George Orwell's 1984. Uh, you know how we have credit scores here in the U.S. And, and that number tells um, tells people a lot about you, but it's just about your credit worthiness. Well, they, they've extended that concept to everything you do online. And, and they make it a social credit score. In other words, how good a person are you? So if you, um, for instance, donate money via some you know, online app, you get extra points for that if you donate money to a, a good charity. However, if you play a lot of video games or watch a lot of porn yeah. online, you get um, <laughs> negative bad. points. And presumably, if you speak out against the existing power structure, you get lots of negative points. And if, if you get a, a sufficiently low score, um, you're really penalized by that. You know, you can't um, take first class travel in China, for instance, if you've got a low score. You can't get credit. A lot of places just won't let you shop there. Um, and it's a it's a public number. So you're shunned by your friends because if you have friends with low credit scores at lo or low social credit scores, it lowers your score. So so you get shunned by everybody if you have a low score. Nobody wants to be seen with you. You're like the unpopular kid on the playground that uh, you're penal penalized for hanging out with in school. Well, then now they've got a whole country that has the same kind of, um, of system. And it's a really profoundly powerful method of social control because yeah. you don't really have much recourse. If your score drops, uh, you can't go to some independent <laughs> agency and say, hey, you know what? That's a mistake. Move my score back up. <laughs> they say, uh, sorry, <laughs> it is what it is, or they just don't even take your calls. And yeah. so when the government's mad at you in that kind of a system, they can bas basically shut you out of public life. Uh, and the technology exists for that now. Mm -hmm. So the, the scary thing is that we could easily emulate emulate something like that here where you tie in somebody's, um, you know, Facebook activity, along with their LinkedIn activity, along with their emails, along with their texts and their, you know, traditional credit score related stuff to to end up with a score here that puts you totally at the mercy of the government. You know, if they want to manipulate that score, they, they will totally do it because, I mean, they already manipulate the financial yeah. markets now. So manipulating somebody's social score um, is a tiny little step from where we are now. So this is something that we need to watch and need to pay attention yeah. to. That's for sure. Hey, well, you know, they could be doing it here in the U.S. and we wouldn't even know about it. There are so many scales for figuring out your credit, so many credit scores, and there could easily be these social scales as well although perhaps not directly at the behest of the government, but certainly it can be done with all the involuntary tracking that's taking place on your computer. No fewer than 50, 60 different entities are tracking your computer usage at this moment, no matter who you are, unless you've blocked out all cookies, which is gonna create performance issues for your computer, for your browser window. Um, you know, I guess you could be using the Tor internet browser and that will help somewhat, but what are you supposed to do here, John? Well, uh, I think that's going to be a big issue for, um, you know, the survivalist side of things, people who are, are taking steps 
to um, to protect themselves from what they see as a, a crisis of some sort. Um, the, the whole online privacy thing, and you know, there's a book by Kevin Mitnick, the um, the most oh, famous yeah. hacker in the world, uh, called The Art of Invisibility, which I own. You know, I haven't actually read it yet, but it's sitting there, and he shows you how to erase your yourself from view of a lot of these systems out there that now track what you do, as you said, they track pre pretty much everything you do online. Uh, and it's just waiting for those databases to be combined into one database that has a score, <laughs> you know, that defines yeah. your life. Um, so one of the things we'll have to start paying attention to is how to minimize your footprint out there and how to make yourself as invisible as possible to the people who are spying on you um, with your tacit approval now, like you said, through cookies and, and on Facebook and stuff like that. You know, Facebook is doing something which uh, I, I might be getting myself into trouble by speaking about it without completely understanding it. But they're they're ranking the trustworthiness of news sources and of posts right. by their their users now. And if you have a trustworthiness score on on, on Facebook. That's not far from the, um, you know, the, the, the social credit score that we're talking about in China, right? If, if Facebook has the ability to arbitrarily say that you're not trustworthy, uh, that's a big problem for you. And it, apparently they do have that ability now, you know? So, uh, so this is going to be an issue that um, is going to be discussed within, you know, libertarian circles and, uh, and civil liberty circles going forward. Uh, and and I, I think it's, it's probably worthwhile getting to know the issue and learning the uh, the details of it to be able to participate in that discussion when the time comes, because the outcome of it is a very big deal. You know, are we going to have something like what China's building now or are we going to put safeguards in place that prevent that from happening and make it absolutely impossible for a centralized database to to ruin your life with a single number or, uh, you know, a single term? Uh, and, you know, hopefully the good guys win this debate. But. You know, in this world, it, it's it's not clear that that's a, a high probability outcome. We'll see. It's still early in the game here. Nobody can really tell who's going to win or lose. But it's it's interesting because at least when you have an error on your credit report, there is a system that you can follow and you can go to sue people in court as well. If there's something really egregious or really bringing your score down. I wonder with these social scores how easily you're going to be able to do it. And the other thing, John, is the other scores that they're using, the other uh, scoring systems, which are financial at this point, you don't even know about most of them because they're never disclosed to you. And I guess unless somebody makes a credit decision using it, they don't have to disclose it to you. So you might not even be getting offers, great financial offers, that you would otherwise be entitled to if they had the correct score on these other rating systems. So you can be damaged right now and not even know about it. Oh yeah, but but as far as a credit score goes, a low credit score is kind of a blessing in disguise because yeah. <laughs> it, it makes it harder for you to borrow money. <laughs> Very true. So I, I, I think that um, as far as that goes, it's, you know, that's more like tough love <laughs> than anything else. But once it extends to, uh, you know, your political activities and your your online search history and stuff like that, mm -hmm. that, that we're getting into a very, very dangerous um, piece of territory. Um, so, yeah, we, we need to pay attention to this. Yes. Um, and, and China, because it's it's the world's most successful dictatorship definitely bears watching because it's it's uh, blazing the trail that Japan and the Soviet Union once blazed in terms of government control over the populace and the debate over whether that the resulting efficiency is a good thing or a bad thing, you know? Very true. Well, 